It's the Megacast, an hour-long TV and radio streaming show keeping you informed on the day-to-day -day news. Live from West Bloomfield, we're bringing you the news, updates, and information impacting communities around Michigan. Join our host, Tyler Keeft, as he talks with community members, business leaders, and professional experts about the stories that impact you. You're watching the Megacast on Civic Center TV. Coming up on the Megacast, we'll talk to Metro EHS about their range of pediatric therapies, plus our weekly market talk with Oakland University's Michael Greiner and one of over 300 charities and nonprofits from the Shared to Play platform. This Friday on the Megacast, weekdays at 10 a.m. on Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. I'm Steve Eisenman of the Detroit Red Wings, and I think every child in Michigan deserves a safe, healthy, and happy childhood. Can we build a state where children trust Michigan isn't just a name, but something our kids believe? Please support Children Trust Michigan as the voice for children and families by visiting the website to learn more. When the temperatures are chilly, being together warms the soul. Keep the winter fun going. Help protect yourself and those around you by keeping your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Hello, nose. My nose noses when somebody uses the bathroom. Mom, all I need is flush. Ooh, I smell cookies. I smell an A+. Plus. How could my nose be running when it stays on my face? Our noses know. If those sniffles are just a cold, allergies, or COVID-19, so swab it, test it. It's good to know. There are many different kinds of noses. Our noses can sniff out all kinds of things. Good things and bad things. Your nose knows if those sniffles are just a cold, allergies, or COVID-19. So swab it, test it, it's good to know. Many people are feeling overwhelmed and struggling with mental wellness these days. So be kind to your mind. Give yourself permission to breathe. Share your feelings. You are not alone. Have hope. Talk to a Stay Well counselor for free confidential help 24-7 through the COVID-19 hotline. When you have a gambling problem, you have a money problem. Don't let your gambling cause you financial hardship. If you or someone you love is struggling with gambling, we can help. Get free confidential counseling and win your life back. Learn more at michigan.gov slash problem gambling. One in four Michigan homes has high levels of radon, a naturally occurring radioactive gas known to cause lung cancer. It doesn't matter where you live or what type of home you have. You won't even know it's there unless you test. So don't wait. Testing is cheap and easy. And if there's a problem, it's simple to fix. Visit michigan.gov slash radon to learn more. We took action, will you? Big Center TV with our brand new live captions. To turn on live captions, go to civiccentertv.com and click watch live. 
In your web browser, click on the Options tab in the top right and find the Accessibilities tab. Then just switch on live captions to heighten your enjoyment of our local programming. Thank you so much for watching Civic Center TV. When you have a gambling problem, you have a money problem. Don't let your gambling cause you financial hardship. If you or someone you love is struggling with gambling, we can help. Get free confidential counseling and win your life back. Learn more at michigan.gov slash problem gambling. You're listening to your radio homes for the Megacast, 89.3 WBLD Orchard Lake and 88.1 WBFH Bloomfield Hills. Today's edition of the Megacast begins now. Welcome to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Today, we'll be talking to a number of people about topics of interest and importance to Michiganders like you. Let's begin with what's making headlines on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page. Our top story comes from Arpan Lobo at the Detroit Free Press. A three-judge panel of uh, Michigan Court of Appeals judges has rejected a change to the Michigan minimum wage law. This comes after opposition to a Republican-led legislature bill uh, that was passed in 2018 that would have risen the minimum wage to about $12 by 2022, which was then later amended to be reaching that point, not this year, but in, in, not, sorry, not in 2022, but rather be reaching the $12 per hour point in 2030, all while maintaining the tipped minimum wage at 38% of its regular counterpart. Well, a group called Mothering Justice sued the legislature for its procedures that changed the, the wages uh, when the wages would reach $12 an hour. In July, Judge Douglas Shapiro from the Court of Claims sided with Mo Mothering Justice to amend the language of the legislation to the group's original intention, which would have raised regular minimum wage to $13.03 an hour by mid-February of this year. That decision was appealed by state attorneys and then later overruled by the uh, Court of Appeals uh, this week, uh, stating that the legislature had acted within its legal means to adopt the language that they did and then uh, swiftly amend that adopted language as the bill was being passed uh, when, uh, in 2018. Currently, Michigan's regular minimum wage sits at $10.10 per hour with the tipped minimum wage at $3.00 and 84 cents per hour. Also making headlines today from Robert Snell at the Detroit News, an update on a story we discussed a few weeks back on the program. A federal appeals court judge has ordered that the Detroit Institute of Arts or DIA must hold on to a missing Van Gogh painting that is worth millions. The owner, a Brazilian collector named Gustavo Soter, says that his painting was stolen and has been missing for over six years, and that, they, that the DIA has it in their possession. The DIA recently concluded its Van Gogh in America exhibit where the painting was on display, but says it will continue to comply with court orders in this case as it continues to be investigated, stating, quote, the DIA will fully comply with the order from the U.S. Court of Appeals regarding the custody of the novel reader and will be responding on January 30th to the plaintiff's recent pleading, and the DIA will have no further comment prior to a ruling by the court, and closed quote. A week ago, U.S. District Court Judge George Karam Stee stated that the painting could not be immediately seized from the DIA because of a federal law that grants immunity to foreign arts that are on display in the United States. All of this continues to go on as the owner of, this, of the allegedly stolen 1888 painting says the DIA has his property and the courts try to sort through a real mess of a case. There's plenty of more information to dive into on this topic and updates certainly to come from the, the Detroit News and other outlets, I highly encourage you to click through to this article on our website, civiccentertv.com on our local news page and read all of Robert Snell's works on this in full as well as supporting details from the Detroit News. 
finally making headlines today on civiccenterTV.com. It's a local news page from Ryan Zook at MLive. A hometown hero is coming back to town. Wayne State University announced yesterday that it is hiring former University of Michigan and NFL running back Tyrone Wheatley as its new head coach. Wheatley, who went to high school in Dearborn Heights, spent last season as the running backs coach for the Denver Broncos after three years at the helm as head coach at Morgan State University. Coach Wheatley takes over a Warriors team that was quite abysmal in 2022, finishing with a record of one and nine overall. Coach Wheatley was a legend in the college game in the 90s with the University of Michigan, finishing his career fifth in program history in career rushing yards and second in career rushing touchdowns. Tyrone Wheatley was also a prolific All-American track and field athlete in his college days as well and hopes to bring Wayne State uh, back to some level of success in college football in the near future. So congratulations to Coach Wheatley as well as the team at Wayne State University and good luck in years forward as the a new leadership of that, that football program comes into fold. All of those headlines are making news today on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our local news page, along with all of our top stories from throughout this week. We clear that page on each Monday morning before our first live show of the week and only have the most recent stories from throughout the week that we're reporting on uh, from throughout the state of Michigan. Headlines uh, on all different kinds of topics from news to public interest, sports and beyond can be found on that website daily before our shows. And we'll talk about them right here on the Megacast at the beginning of our 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. live shows, Monday through Friday. Also on our, mag on our local news page, we have updates from the CDC, the NBHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division's COVID-19 specific web pages, as well as other public health information from these local, state, and federal institutions helping to keep you safe each and every day in our community. We have a great show ahead on this Friday edition of the Megacast, the busy show ahead, so we'll get right to it in just a few minutes. We'll talk about a number of pediatric therapy services with the team at Metro EHS. That's coming up next on the Megacast. The heart of winter, it beats inside you. It's that thing urging you outside when the forecast calls for snow. Some were born with it. For others, it was carved with care. But for all who take winter to heart, it's time. Feel the rhythm of the season and pursue your pure in Pure Michigan. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov slash voices4. Ronnie started doing prescription pills at the age of 15, and by 19, he died. If your child is struggling with drug use, try not to be too proud to reach out for help. Don't be worried about what the neighbor will think or your family. Just get your child the help they need. Sometimes it's the hard road to take, but um, the hard road is nothing compared to living with the fact that your child is no longer with you. There's hope and help at drugfree.org. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Learn more about our program on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. That's the page where you'll find all the information you need to know on each and every one of our partnering stations, creating live and live to tape original programming all across Oakland County and throughout the state of Michigan. Visit our website on our megacast page. Click through and you'll be able to see all the original programming from these different organizations on TV, on the radio, and streaming all across southeastern Michigan. In addition, if you're not able to join us every single day for our live shows from 10 a.m to 11 a.m. as well as live to tape in the early afternoons on a couple other of our outlets. You can always find us on demand, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also find individual interview segments in case you don't uh, have an hour to spend with us every day, but you have 15, 20 minutes on certain topics that you can sprinkle throughout your week. All of those are on demand there as well. Civiccentertv.com slash megacast. 
Joining us now on the program are a couple of individuals from Metro EHS. Anthony Davish and Portia Covington join us now to talk about a number of different pediatric therapy services that they provide at their business. Thank you both for being with us today. Hi. Thanks for having us. Glad to have you both on. Uh, uh, Anthony, let's begin with you. Just tell us a little bit about Metro EHS and some of the different forms of pediatric therapy that your business provides. Sure. Um, we do. We offer uh, pediatric therapy such as uh, ABA, which is Applied Behavioral Analysis. Uh, we offer speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, feeding and swallowing, as well as uh, counseling uh, for children across the Metro Detroit area. We have uh, 14 locations across Metro Detroit, and we currently just opened a brand new location on Orchard Lake in West Bloomfield. And sometimes these are therapies that are necessary for uh, major complications or for developmental issues that can arise at early ages. And, and certainly the earlier you address these issues, we've heard on so many different uh, fronts, uh, the better those results tend to be. And so Portia, tell us about uh, the, the typical clientele that usually is coming through uh, Metro EHS to, to take on these services because you do provide a wide range, but they are pediatric services and everything's always going to be a little bit different when it involves our kids. So we um, have anywhere from infants around three months um, up to around the age of 15. We um, also have feeding and swallowing therapy for those little ones that are just born and having a few problems latching on to. Um, we offer the best type of therapy, it's very intensive for um, our children's needs because there's speech, there's occupational therapy, there's physical therapy and um, applied behavioral analysis all within the same building. So um, all of our staff tend to work together to make sure that the child is fully developed um, to the best of their ability within our care. And and, and uh, back to you, Anthony. As we met, as you mentioned, and, and Portia mentioned, some of those you know swallowing and and feeding therapies too, especially for those younger uh, younger uh, kids and those infants that may be having trouble with some of these you know, what we consider to be basic behaviors and, and basic acts that we that we tend to take for granted each and every day. How common is it for you know, for kids of of those ages to have some of these problems and need to seek some of these therapies? Uh, there's a wide range. Um, it's actually a lot more common than people think. Um, a lot of kids are picky eaters. Um, it used to, for example, we had a patient that only ate chicken nuggets <laughs> and that was it. Um, as well as there's more in-depth uh, problems that kids have with uh, feeding and swallowing, um, which we tend to uh, find the resolution for any problem that comes to our table. I would imagine to provide these therapies to kids, especially at the at ages of uh, you know, a lot a lot of plasticity or a, a greater need for development and, and some of these more, you know, so to speak, basics uh, of human of human life and human uh, behaviors each and every day, that that, is, that makes these a lot more intricate than it would maybe be if you were providing some of these sorts of therapies to an adult. So how does that change the approach or how does that maybe modify the approach, Portia, as you're uh, beginning to treat some of these uh, pediatric patients and hopefully have great results ahead for them so they can lead a much more normal li lives like uh, you and I do? Um, the one thing that we have to keep in mind is that it takes a lot of patience to deal with these um, clients. It takes a lot of communication um, and to know that the answer is not just going to happen the next day. Um, it will take a lot of understanding for the parents to work on all efforts at home um, to see the progress. We may have children um, with us for a couple months, and sometimes it may take a couple years, um, but we just want to make sure that we're touching every aspect that the child needs um, within the time frame that we actually have them. Um, so it's it, it's a it's a pro, it's a progressive journey to get to get through um, therapy. 
You can find more information on a number of their services, and they're quite extensive from, as they mentioned, ABA and, and speech and occupational therapy, all the way to special education staffing and homeschool services as well. Find more information on the website, metroehs.com, with locations all across southeastern Michigan. You can call them as well at 313-278-4601, 313-278-4601. For more information, and, and then uh, Anthony, there's a number of different therapies that you are providing through Metro EHS at your locations all across southeastern Michigan. And uh, given that there is such a wide range, wide range, how do you keep up with that in terms of of, of staffing and, and in terms of making sure that you, know, you have the right experts in the right locations for these different specialties, considering that they are so wide ranging. Um, I, we're constantly hiring people. Uh, there is no wait list, which it makes us uh, set up differently from other therapy centers. Um, we just have a wide range of, uh, we do hiring events. So if anyone out there is interested in uh, coming to join our team, uh, please give us a call as well. Um, but it's it's a constant constant effort to try to get people to join us uh, as therapists and stuff like that. Someone, um, a lot of our therapists, or most of our therapists, pretty much all of our therapists are board certified and stuff like that. So we're constantly going to colleges and doing uh, hiring events and and it's just so on and so on. <laughs> Portia, we've seen over the last few years, especially uh, due to the pandemic, that telehealth and, and teletherapy has become much more of the norm uh, than it was in the past. And, and it's one of the many services that are provided by Metro EHS, not just to individual patients, but also the school. So tell us about your teletherapy programs and how that benefits both these individual patients and families, but also even some of our schools that may be in need of some of this help. It's an awesome service that we offer, the teletherapy. My son actually receives speech therapy um, via virtual um, meetings with his speech pathologist. And the platform that we have is engineered for pediatric ages. Um, it's not very hard. He's five and he's able to maneuver through the website pretty easily. Um, the staff are able to see everything that the child does on the virtual um, platform. So it's pretty amazing to see therapy happening virtually. Um, we offer dietitian service services virtually, um, our speech pathologists and occupational therapists that are in the schools are able to do virtual meetings with their um, clients as well. So um, it's pretty amazing to see the virtual opportunities that are out there for our children. More information can be found on their website, metroehs.com. That is metroehs.com for more information. And, and um, Anthony, for, for families that may be in need of some of these different therapies for their kids, we hear so much, uh, we, we talked recently with an expert uh, in autism spectrum disorder and those sort and those and treatments for those that are on the autism spectrum. And, and she had mentioned that you know, the earlier you get some of these treatments going, the better results you typically have, especially in younger patients, uh, in terms of what their outcomes are from the results of these different therapies. So what, what are you, what's Metro EHS's suggestion on, you know, because there's so many different numbers of these therapies that are available on just how effective they are, especially for these pediatric patients, if they're getting in there earlier and if these are detected earlier on to have as best of an outcome as possible? Uh, the best outcome you, or the first thing you can do is actually go get a screening. Um, you can go to your pediatrician, they can refer you to us. Or we do screenings all the time at our centers. Um, that would be the, if you detect anything uh, unusual, which Portia can probably explain that better than I can. But um, the first step is actually getting a screening. It's not an evaluation, but it's a step to see um, if your child has any of uh, any issues, not just uh, autism, but uh, in speech, uh, physical therapy, stuff like that, or occupational therapy. It helps get their motor skills going at an early age and it's easier for them to actually it gets them used to uh working with someone else other than their mother or father and that's another issue um what, what what's good about our company is that we actually educate the parents on um 
on uh, what the problem is and what we do so they can actually do that at home as well. Yeah. So the first step would be actually doing a screening. Yeah, and if I might jump in, um, as far as autism goes, there's a questionnaire that um, are typically given by your pediatrician for your child, just to see where they are as far as their developmental milestones. Um, and sometimes that questionnaire by your pediatrician can show signs of potential autism. Um, and one of the best benefits of catching it early is that the child is not yet enrolled in school, so there's more time in the day to receive more therapeutic care. And Portia, just a, a few more minutes here, a couple more minutes before we need to say goodbye. You are a parent that, uh, and you mentioned that you have had your child uh, uh, receive speech therapy too. So, so from a parent's perspective, what advice do you have for parents that may be seeking some of these services to uh, you know, provide the best support that they can for their child, but also to, to ensure that they're getting the right therapies at the right time for their kids to have as great of an outcome as they can for their children? So my child received speech therapy as well as occupational therapy with Metro EHS and um, he is now enrolled in school full time and I want to say the best thing about Metro EHS is although he's not currently receiving occupational therapy, um, the therapist is willing to reach out to his school and open those lines of communication to see how he has developed thus far. Um, it's amazing to see how far our staff are willing to go to make sure that the child is overall well taken care of, whether it's in school or in family life, um, as well as their own social and emotional um, needs. You can find more information on Metro EHS and all of their services, as well as their various locations across southeastern Michigan and teletherapy options as well on their website, MetroEHS.com, or give them a call for more information and consultation, 313-278-4601. Anthony, Portia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank Thanks you. For having us. Thank you. We'll take a break now on the megacast on the other side pressure from federal uh, regulators and the legislature on both Google and Ticketmaster and is inflation cooling in the United States. Michael Griner from Oakland University joins us next for a weekly market talk on the megacast. Let's savor these moments made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. I'm Steve Eisenman of the Detroit Red Wings, and I think every child in Michigan deserves a safe, healthy, and happy childhood. Can we build a state where children trust Michigan isn't just a name, but something our kids believe? Please support Children Trust Michigan as the voice for children and families by visiting the website to learn more. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more on our website, civiccentertv.com, on our Megacast page to find more information on all of our partnering stations across the Great Lakes State and find all of our full shows and each individual interview on demand as well. All of that on our website, civiccentertv.com slash Megacast. Joining us now is Michael Greiner from Oakland University School of Business Administration for our weekly market talk. Plenty going on once again in, in the last several days since we last spoke, Michael. And let's begin with... Uh, What's going on with, at the federal level as regulators are, are starting to clamp down on Ticketmaster and Google and, all, and other large organizations, particularly those that are providing concert and other event tickets, something that was uh, bringing up quite the controversy a few months ago as Taylor Swift's tour tickets went on sale and uh, well, a lot of people took out a second mortgage. <laughs> good good way to put it. You know, it's kind of interesting to see that Taylor Swift is one person who can bring together both the Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill. But that's exactly what happened. 
And they had a hearing last week uh, where they uh, essentially grilled the leadership of Live Nation, which is the parent company of Live Nation Entertainment as well as uh, Ticketmaster. And the issue is this, is that Live Nation basically provides the artists for, for some of these venues, while Ticketmaster kind of gets these contracts with these different venues to sell their tickets. So the concern is that Ticketmaster is basically using the threat of not providing some of these artists to some of these venues if they don't use them to sell their tickets. And uh, there, there, you know, there were claims that, oh, we've resolved this, it shouldn't be a problem. But then it came up that it was a problem. And so actually there was a court ordered settlement uh, to continue oversight of, uh, of this uh, acquisition, which occurred about two thousand in about 2010. Um, and uh, so it's not quite clear how that's working. And, and you know, one thing that can't be understated is really just the threats, the fear that there is that uh, some of these venues could be left out from some of these high profile tours is really something that they're concerned with. And they have these relationships and they develop with people. So to be to be fair, I think that the that the that the feds have a real legitimate concern here. And uh, uh, to take the side of the Swifties on that, I, I do agree that probably Ticketmaster and Live Nation do have a monopoly that they're probably abusing. You have to remember, though, the there's nothing wrong with developing a monopoly within an industry just because of the fact that you have a good product and everybody wants to use it. The problem arises when you use your strong position in one industry to essentially take over another industry. And that's kind of what they're claiming Live Nation is doing with using its strength with the artists then to kind of keep out competitors from the ticket selling space. And uh, we see also a lawsuit that was filed against Google. Um, and uh, this one talks about their, uh, their advertising approach. And of course, Google is incredibly profitable, largely because of advertising. In fact, one of the questions I always ask my students is, what business is Google in? And you know, inevitably some will say, oh, it's in the search engine business, oh, it's in the internet business, blah, blah, blah. But eventually, someone will fall on the fact that actually Google is in the advertising business, and that's the business that they actually make money at. Everything else is basically just oriented as a way for them to make money in advertising. Well, as it turns out, what Google has done is that they've also bought up a lot of the companies that basically support the process of advertising. So, uh, for example, there are companies that allow the payments uh, for advertising and other companies that will essentially distribute advertisements then on other websites sites. And Google, as it turns out, has bought up a lot of those uh, through their parent company, Alphabet. And so the uh, concern is, again, that because of their dominant position then as the dominant player in advertising on the internet, then they're able to essentially buy up these other companies that then make it harder for new competitors to enter into the into this industry. Um, so uh, that's that's really what the, uh, the FTC is trying to do and the Justice Department is trying to do right now. And the, the concern is this, and this is really where we're seeing some innovation here in antitrust law, which is that typically courts have looked for there to be some kind of impact on consumers, uh, that consumers are paying a higher price uh, as a result of the, uh, this antitrust activity. And, um, uh, and that's where these lawsuits have typically succeeded. But now what the Justice Department and the FTC are trying to do is say, wait a minute, it's not just about the consumers. What it's done is it's impacted either innovation in new industries or consumer choice. Um, these are things that might not directly be reflected in the price that consumers are paying, but still have an impact in creating an environment where there's not so much competition and not so much dynamism for our economy. And, and just to go back to some of the issues with Ticketmaster, because there was a hearing earlier this week in committee uh, in, in the Senate uh, where to, uh, Senator Tom Kennedy from Louisiana, Republican, had proposed even some perhaps regulation should be put in place on resale of these tickets, because we saw when the, uh, the Taylor Swift tour, when those tickets went on sale, a lot of the reason why people had trouble getting tickets is because you had bots that were buying hundreds, if not thousands of these tickets and then attempting to resell them for even more inflated prices later on. And so you know, these anti-heroes causing a lot of bad blood that regulators now are trying to shake off. And it, what, what really can be done at the federal level to address some of these issues, particularly on the resale, given that these are independent companies, but like you mentioned, the, that partnership really where the antitrust problem comes into play is 
is between that relationship with Live Nation and Ticketmaster, not necessarily in some of the ways that Ticketmaster does its selling of the tickets. Yeah, I actually agree with your point here. And the and as an economist, I really chafed when I saw that suggestion that somehow there should be some restriction on the resale of tickets because you know, that's a market, you know, and if they and if we believe in free markets here in the United States, then when somebody has something that they can sell at a profit, they should be able to sell it. That's kind of the way the free markets work. And I found it interesting that you had a uh, conservative uh, Republican uh, senator suggesting that where typically they've taken the position that we should give some deference to free markets. And here he is saying that somehow we should restrict one that's really uh, a, a very much a free market. I'd say that the bigger issues here um, that the feds can step in are, are twofold. Number one, what the what Ticketmaster has done, ironically, is in addition to selling the tickets, they've actually established themselves as a major player then in the resale market. So, for example, if you buy a ticket and want to resell your ticket, frequently you'll go through Ticketmaster to do that, that they kind of provide the medium that through which you're able to resell your ticket to others, oftentimes at a profit. And the biggest place now, I think, that most people go to to purchase uh, their resold tickets, they'll scalp tickets as it's put, is through Ticketmaster itself. Uh, so that's kind of ironic there. And it makes you wonder if that seems a little bit odd that you have kind of both ends of the spectrum being controlled by one company. And then again, the issue with, uh, um, with them having control of Live Nation. And really what the issue is, is this, is that the although it might not directly translate into a higher cost for consumers, although my guess is it probably does, it's just hard to prove in court. Uh, but what it certainly does is it limits innovation, is it limits new ideas coming into the space. And could this situation with Ticketmaster and the and the sale of uh, Taylor Swift tickets been been handled better? Possibly. Probably had there been a company that really decided they were going to try to innovate in the space and come up with some new technology that might make things more uh, uh, easier to easier to deal with. And uh, given the fact, though, that Ticketmaster has such control over the over this market and is able then to kind of keep out potential competitors with their control of live mark of uh, of. Uh, um, of uh, Live Nation, then as a result of it, they really don't have an incentive then to innovate in this one space. Uh, so that's really what the issue is. And I think that that what's more interesting is talk among some of the senators that really we need to start talking about maybe breaking up Ticketmaster and Live Nation, that Live Nation should perhaps be a separate company. And is it really appropriate then also that Ticketmaster is also a, then a player in the resale of tickets, uh, that maybe those should also be separate companies. So I think that really the bigger solution would be some type of effort to try to break up the company. But of course, that's something that the company will fight tooth and nail. Yeah, they, a lot of pressure being put on the on Ticketmaster and, uh, and on Live Nation and, and their operations. We've seen these sort of breakups be forced before by the federal government in these antitrust cases, uh, whether it be in way back in, in uh, radio and in television and, in, and in certainly in film on multiple yep. occasions to prevent yep. from these sort of monopolizing of different parts of the industry. And uh, so yep. tons of pressure yep. being put on Ticketmaster at this time. And they really wish they could go back to December. That's the end of my Taylor Swift puns for today. We'll move on. They, I think they really regret what happened. I think you're right about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on. Uh, there's some good signs out in the economy that uh, after about six months of a lot of ups and downs, inflation may be taking a little bit of, of a cool down from where it has been at, at its peak. And even with Walmart raising some of its wages too, that could be another good sign for our economy. Uh, just how much of a cooling may inflation be going through if it is at all and uh, what sort of good signs are out there that maybe we're turning a corner here yeah you know this is once again kind of the interesting story of this economy which is that pretty much everybody when you look at the surveys thinks the economy is doing badly but when you look at the data there's a lot of good positive information out there right now. And in fact, we just received more good uh, good news yesterday when it turned out that the economy uh, over the last quarter grew by a 2.9% uh, increase uh, to the gross domestic product when you annual annualize that amount. That means that over the last two quarters, basically the, sec the third and fourth quarters uh, of last year, the economy actually grew at an annualized rate of above 3%, which is really very healthy for an economy our size. Uh, 
so um, the uh, so once again, it seems like we're getting all this good news, and certainly uh, in terms of inflation, uh, we've been talked about this before, where it appears that inflation is slowing down pretty dramatically. Um, it depends upon which indicator you look at, but certainly when you take into consideration uh, certain ways of measuring the housing costs, that we might actually be getting close to the 2% uh, inflation rate that the Fed wants to see. But there's so much at play in this economy that's so huge that you never know how one thing's gonna affect another. Like for example, we keep hearing from some of these tech giants that they're laying off people. Uh, and in fact, there's been an indication that there's been as much as 800,000 layoffs that have been announced by some of these uh, larger companies. And that might seem like a lot, and indeed it is. But uh, then when you look at the numbers more deeply, you find out the fact that in fact, among tech workers, the unemployment rate is about 2%. So these tech workers are gonna be reemployed very quickly. Uh, and what's more is that while these larger companies have been engaging in some layoffs, at the same time, me small to medium-sized uh, enterprises, SMEs as we call them, have actually been hiring at a rate far in excess of what these uh, companies have been laying off. So while there might have been as many as 800,000 layoffs announced by these companies. At the same time, these small and medium-sized companies are increasing their employment by as much as three and a half million. Uh, so uh, it's uh, it's kind of uh, one of those things that each time you get a piece of bad news, then there's some piece of good news that outweighs it. And uh, in and and the Walmart announcement that we just saw that uh, they're going to be increasing the minimum wage that they are paying their employees essentially from $12 an hour up to $14 an hour um, and that on average that will raise the uh, the wages that they pay their employees company-wide uh, by about uh, 50 50 cents per hour from about $17 on average to about 17 50 per uh, per hour on average um, that uh, again this is this is kind of a good news bad news on the one hand it shows that the employment uh, market is still hot people can still get jobs even though we hear about these uh, layoffs uh, Walmart is significant because, of course, Walmart is the nation's largest private employer um, with, I believe, 1.3 million employees. So they're a huge employer. And when they make a move in the labor market, it's a, it's going to have impact far beyond uh, just what uh, their company uh, does. And... Um, and what's more is, uh, though, on the on the other hand, it kind of says that, well, uh, is this going to be something then that drives inflation a little bit more and pushes the Fed to increase interest rates a little bit more? Because, of course, that's what then slows down the economy. Um, and in fact, next week, and we'll probably be talking about this next Friday, next week, the Fed's going to be meeting again to talk about their latest increase in the uh, in the interest rates. And the expectation is that probably they're not going to do another half percent increase the way they've been doing for the past number of months, but it might be a quarter percent increase because they want to kind of slow things down and see how they're impacting the economy. But, you know, again, we get these indications that the economy is still hot, even though there's all this talk about, oh, you know, doom and gloom we have all these problems here and then you come with you know walmart increasing their wages and something that indicates that they still have faith in the american economy and that they're going to be putting even more money into people's pockets which then boosts up the economy some more and that the economy was growing faster than people expected and that the uh uh, and that the uh, uh, unemployment rate is still at a, really a historic low. You know, all these things are positive indications, and uh, really it shows what a challenging job the Fed has right now to try to manage this. It, or have we turned the corner on inflation? Probably the consensus is yes, we have at this point, um, but how fast it's going to go down back to normal rates and uh, how long it's going to take for us to get there, that's still a debate and pretty much whatever economists you talk to, they're going to give you a different answer. Yeah, it seems to be that uh, in, instead of trying to prevent that free fall from happening and providing that last little bit of support, now it's more of just easing it back down into a sense of yep. normal from our government's point of view. Uh, just another couple of minutes with you, Michael, before we're about to say goodbye yep. for this week. Uh, I do want to go over uh, you know, the latest with our favorite guy on. Uh, in this segment, <laughs> Elon Musk, and what's going oh, on with yes. him. Not on the Twitter side this time. This time it's uh, you know, back in, <laughs> in his old house uh, at Tesla where some controversy with him uh, potentially trying to, to have taken uh, his company from public back to private and issues with some of those investors. What's been going on with that? 
Yeah, some of you may remember this. This was a big story back in 2018 when he tweeted out, uh, this was, of course, before he owned Twitter, but he tweeted out that he wanted, that was considering taking Tesla private um, at uh, 420, meaning at $420 per share, uh, and that he had secured the financing for it. Um, well, shortly thereafter then, uh, he changed his tune and said, oh, no, no, I really am not going to do that. Now, the problem is $420 a share was more than Tesla was trading for at the time on the open market. So as a result of that, you had a lot of investors who said, hey, this is a great opportunity for us to get you know, a big, uh, uh, you know, Tesla to bargain. So we're going to buy Tesla with the uh, with the understanding that it's probably going to be sold in the relative near future at $420 a share. So if we get it at less than $420 a share, it's a good investment. Well, the problem is it turns out that when Elon Musk made that announcement, he probably did not have financing for it. Uh, and that brings us to what is considered fraud. Now, fraud is basically when you lie about something and you know you're lying about something uh, and you say it anyway, and it hurts other people. Well, in this case, uh, it appears that he was stating an untruth when he said that he had financing for this uh, because he claims that uh, he had an agreement with, the, uh, with interestingly enough, the Saudis. Uh, this is the same fund that, um, had got had generated some controversy when they when they invested two billion dollars in Jared Kushner, former uh, presidential advisor, uh, in his uh, uh, in his uh, fund. But the uh, but as it turns out, though, uh, the more research that's being done, the more it seems that the Saudis really had not committed to investing in Elon Musk's approach of taking Tesla private. Um, and by private, I mean taking it so it's no longer trade on the stock market. It would instead be controlled by a small group of people, probably headed by Elon Musk. So um, as a result of that, uh, it appears that these people who made this investment based upon this information, uh, then the stock price collapsed and uh, they lost a lot of money on that trade. Well, that appears to be fraud. Um, and as it turns out, the judge has already granted motions uh, by the plaintiffs in favor of their action. So Elon Musk, really a lot of his defenses have already been closed out. And really the only one that's left to him right now is that the uh, people didn't lose their money specifically because of the things he tweeted. Um, that if there's some other reason that they lost their money, then he might escape liability. But the truth of the matter is, uh, I'd say he's got a tough case to make, and he stands to uh, have to pay out another uh, couple hundred million dollars potentially to these plaintiffs, um, which is going to be one more issue that he's going to be struggling with as he's been dealing with all his troubles at uh, Twitter. And of course, he's got other legal issues going on at Tesla right now. So it's just uh, Elon Musk all the time, it seems. He's just always got something going. Yeah, we'll have plenty more to talk about him next week when he does something else that will make the news and all of the other things happening in our markets across the U.S. and around the world. Michael, thanks as always for joining us. Yeah, thanks. Great, great to be here, Tyler. We'll take a break here on the Megacast. On the other side, we'll talk to a local charity and nonprofit that is working to end the stigma of autism against autism spectrum disorder in communities of color. That's coming up next on the Megacast. <laughs> When the temperatures are chilly, being together warms the soul. <laughs> Keep the winter fun going. Help protect yourself and those around you by keeping your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. What's happening around you? Hear about state events, businesses, and from the people behind them on The Megacast, an hour-long TV, radio, and streaming show keeping you informed on the day-to-day -day news. Listen in on talks with volunteer groups, documentarians, and financial advisors Monday to Friday with your host, Tyler Keeft. Catch The Megacast weekdays from 10 a.m. to 11 on Civic Center TV, 89.3 Lakes FM, and streaming on MyMyTV.com. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV and radio and show talking about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Learn more about our program on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll also find us on demand. Joining us now is over one of is one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Shared Detroit platform. Camille Proctor is the founder and the executive director of the Color of Autism Foundation. Camille, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Uh, thank you for having me. Glad to have you on. So tell us about your organization and, and its mission and the work it does in the community. Absolutely. So the Color of Autism Foundation supports families in underserved communities impacted by autism. We're actually a national organization that is here in Michigan, and our goal is to end the disparity um, in that particular in this particular population because there actually is a disparity of so many things um, in communities of color. Yeah, and the treatment of autism spectrum disorders, uh, as well as the detection of these disorders, is something that is so critical, especially at younger ages, for outcomes in the, in these sorts of situations. So, just how uh, you know, just how different is it for for uh, communities of color and underserved communities to uh, to uh, receive some of these services that are so necessary in detecting and then ultimately deciding on the proper treatment for these disorders, which ultimately lead to better outcomes for these individual kids and, and later on these adults? Well, there's a lot of um, things that kind of come into play. So we have the issue where uh, this particular community um, doesn't really like things that are associated with mental health issues. Uh, so you're looking at a situation where children who should be diagnosed between 18 months and two years of age getting a diagnosis at four. And so that's where the disparity is. Um, accessing the services is difficult for them because there aren't very many service providers located and situated inside the city. So we try to combat that by offering parents the information that they need so that they can be successful. They can be successful as a parent that's supporting an autistic person who will soon become an autistic adult. Uh, we also support autistic adults because it's pretty difficult for them. And that we found that in the African American community, um, it's it's better to train. And when I say train, we do a lot of training. We teach parents about um, what autism really is, not what they heard on the internet. Um, we and we offer them facilitators in our trainings that look like them. Now I bet you're saying, why is that important? It's important because we want our parents to be fluid and to share exactly what their questions are and their thoughts so that we can tease out all of the misinformation that they get. And people tend to open up when someone is relatable. And so that's the whole goal. And we don't exclude anyone. We have every person for every walks of life in our trainings and, and we support everyone. But we found that this particular population is just grossly underserved and we wanna end that disparity. So now Camille, where does the Color of Autism Foundation come into play in providing those resources to these, to these individuals and to these families? How do you play a role in connecting them to these resources that they need and helping them bridge some of those gaps that may be present for a number of different reasons in these communities? So our spectrum of care um, training is a five week training where we introduce parents to the therapeutic interventions because let's face it, um, in Michigan, there's a long wait list for everything. And so we have parents on a wait list. So rather than have them wait, um, we're teaching them skills on how to deescalate, um, teach their child how to deescalate themselves, how to make the child comfortable in the environment. We have parents that also call us because they don't know where to go. So we also connect them to the various service providers throughout the state. And we also have a support group for parents. Uh, one of our more popular support groups, believe it or not, is our dad support group. It's called LEAP. And so dads, no offense to the fathers out there, you tend to be a little um, less forthcoming but you're more forthcoming when you're in a group of like individuals again. So we have the LEAP group and our dads come in and they talk about whatever it is they talk about. I don't know because I've never been in the group. It's facilitated actually by one of our dads, Tyrone Green, who was in one of our trainings um, two and a half years ago. So it's gone over really well. We have a great group of gentlemen. It meets twice a month. and. Um, 
it just keeps it keeps growing. There's probably about 25 men in it, which may sound small, but it's actually a lot when you're talking about a support group meeting. We're joined by Camille Proctor on today's edition of the Megacast, the founder and the executive director of the Color of Autism Foundation. You can find more information on their organization, their services, and get in contact with them at thecolorofautism.org, thecolorofautism.org. You can also find them under the Find a Nonprofit section on sharedetroit.org as well for all the different info you need on their services, getting in contact with the organization and other opportunities with the Color of Autism Foundation. And Camille, as people are hearing about these resources and hearing about these different issues in communities of color as it relates to autism spectrum disorder, if a family, if an individual is in need of some of these resources uh, or services uh, that you help to provide to them, how can they best get in contact with your organization to, to tap into some of these resources and get help in their community? Absolutely. They can give us a call at area code 313-444-9045. They can also visit the website, thecolorofautism.org, and they can send us an email at info at thecolorofautism.org. 313-444-9035 is their phone number, thecolorofautism.org is their website for more information. And uh, a, a lot of work goes into these different programs and to provide these supports to individuals uh, in these affected communities, Camille. Uh, how much of that is, how much, how much does uh, volunteerism play in to providing these different services? What sort of opportunities may be available if people would like to help the Color of Autism Foundation provide some of these services to affected families? Well, volunteerism is really big and we have a need, especially for individuals who um, have been in the job coaching um, area because we have a lot of individuals who need to do role play um, with social skills. And I'm talking about uh, autistic adults. Um, and we wanna help them overcome some of the hurdles they face as they look for employment. And so we need job coaches to help us work with them but we need job coaches for everything. We have events, um, someone that can work with the kids or someone could, that could just do something simple as face painting or setting up tables. We welcome you. And, and another great way that people can help if they can't volunteer their time and, and they have the, the means to do so is to volunteer the, some funds to the organization too to help support all these different efforts. When someone donates to the Color of Autism Foundation, what do those donations go to support ultimately on the other side? Well, donations go 100% back into programming. We do not charge for anything. So all of our programs are free. Um, and I wanted to add this. For example, one of the biggest problems for parents who have kids on the spectrum, especially when you're talking in underserved areas, is child care. If you have a yeah. child on the spectrum in, in the city, you don't have daycare. So we're training daycare workers in Detroit on how to be culturally responsive and also um, uh, the ability to care for these children. I'm sorry, I forgot what I was going to say, sensory friendly. So we're working on training them so they can help these parents get in the workforce and they're not turning any child away. We're joined by Camille Proctor, the founder and executive director of the Color of Autism Foundation on today's edition of the Megacast. Uh, four different ways to get in contact with them, sharedetroit.org thecolorofautism.org. You can send them an email, info at thecolorofautism.org, or call them 313-444-9035. Camille, about a minute left before we'll have to wrap things up today. Anything else that our audience should know about the Color of Autism Foundation that we haven't discussed yet today? I think we covered everything, but most importantly, we just want um, everyone to know that everyone is accepted into our group and you don't have to be a specific anything. You're welcome. If you need the help, contact us. We'll find you um, and connect you to the right resources. They do great work and, and provide excellent resources to help you navigate uh, your situation as an individual with autism and certainly for families uh, with kids and, and even adult children affected by autism. Camille, thank you so much for joining us today. My Michigan TV is streaming everywhere on Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and more smart TV apps.